another escalation of the global coronavirus warning. The World Health Organization lifts its risk level to very high. Australia's federal government announcing tighter restrictions on travelers coming in from overseas. Also tonight, the UN's assessment of the latest tension in the Syrian conflict, how regional powers are approaching the situation. Controversial swimmer Sun Yang maintains his innocence as sport's top court hands down a career-ending ban. And preparing to show what matters, revelers ready for the annual gay and lesbian Mardi Gras. This is SBS World News with Anton Innes. Good evening. With the coronavirus reported in more than 50 countries, World Health Authorities have upgraded the global risk of the disease to very high. It's the top level of risk assessment. And in the past few hours, the Australian government has announced tougher measures, imposing a ban on foreign travellers arriving from Iran. The government not confident the Middle East country can contain the disease. Globally, more than 85,000 people have now been infected. More than 2,900 people have died, the majority in China's Hubei province. South Korea reported its largest daily increase yet as the total number of infections rose by 594 to 2,931. And at home, two more cases of the virus have been confirmed, bringing the total number of infections to 25. Around the world, countries are stepping up preventative measures. In Lebanon, students at this school sprayed with disinfectant, despite the World Health Organization warning this method doesn't kill the virus. Switzerland taking drastic action, becoming the first country to outlaw gatherings of over 1,000 people. Today, more countries, including Mexico, confirmed its first cases. But in China, just four new cases were reported, the lowest number since the country started compiling the data in January. The World Health Organization says there's still a chance to contain the virus. Most cases can still be traced to known contacts or clusters of cases. We do not see evidence as yet that the virus is spreading freely in communities. But in the US, there are signs of community spread. Today, two more coronavirus cases of unknown origin, one in California and another in Oregon, have been confirmed, bringing the total number of cases without prior travel to three. What we know now is that the virus is here, present at some level but we still don't know to what degree. An important priority, therefore, for us is to conduct public health surveillance. This GP clinic in Surrey is being deep cleaned after British authorities there too confirmed the first case of a person being infected without prior travel. In Australia, a 63-year-old Queensland woman who works at a Gold Coast salon contracted the virus after returning from Iran. Authorities are working to track down up to 40 people who went to the salon and were seen by the woman. She saw a number of clients, each for brief interactions, so we believe the risk is incredibly low. The federal government announcing a travel ban on foreigners coming into Australia from Iran, citing the likelihood of a high number of undetected cases there. Non-citizens, uh, permanent residents or their immediate uh, family will be, from the 1st of March, pre uh, prevented from coming to Australia for 14 day, uh, until 14 days have passed from the time they have left Iran. And there were growing fears the number of deaths due to the virus in Iran could be much higher than what officials are letting on. Hospital sources in Iran told the BBC at least 210 patients have died due to the virus, more than six times the official figure of 34. Iran, though, denies information about the extent of the outbreak is being withheld despite the customary cheers to mark the close of trading. Stock markets posted the worst fall this week since the 2008 global financial crisis. The Dow Jones was down 350 points as shares globally fell for a fifth successive day. Lynn Evelyn, SBS World News.
With several government agencies, universities and private companies working to develop a coronavirus vaccine, some scientists say the solution may be in North American caterpillars. We'll reveal why later in the bulletin. The United States says it's reviewing options to assist Turkey following the airstrike by Russian-backed Syrian government troops that killed 33 Turkish troops in northwestern Syria. Turkey's attack in Idlib province was the deadliest on Turkish forces since they entered the Syrian conflict on the opposition side in 2016. The UN Secretary General has called the escalation in fighting one of the most alarming moments of the nine-year conflict. Payback from Turkey. This defence ministry vision shows rocket fire on Syrian government positions in Idlib province. Airstrikes too. Ankara says in total more than 300 Russian-backed Syrian troops were killed in retaliation for this. 33 Turkish soldiers killed in an airstrike on Thursday. Other images show Turkey not so defiant. Here, forces being evacuated from Syria. And tonight, as some of the dead troops were buried, reports that shelling by Syrian government forces had killed another Turkish soldier in Idlib. At the United Nations, the Secretary General spoke of a critical juncture. This is one of the most alarming moments across the duration of the Syrian conflict. Later, in an emergency Security Council session, explaining his fears. The uh, enormous risk that uh, the potential escalation in itself could represent with a conflict of a different nature that could have uh, much more uh, uh, dramatic impacts. He was thinking most probably of Turkey and Bashar al-Assad's ally Russia, trading blame over Thursday's attack. We had prior coordination in writing with Russian forces about the location of our convoy. And airstrikes continued despite our immediate warnings right after the very first attack. Russia denying its planes were responsible. The coordinates conveyed did not mention the areas where Turkish soldiers ultimately died. U.S. President Trump has long tried to avoid confronting Presidents Putin and Erdogan, but he could be about to pick a side in Syria. In a statement condemning the attacks, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said his country was reviewing options to assist Turkey against this aggression as we seek to prevent further Assad regime and Russian brutality. In the days ahead, the United States' commitment to our NATO ally, Turkey, will not waver. While Turkey has urged NATO to deploy Patriot missiles at its border with Syria, NATO's support for now seems mainly verbal. Allies condemn the continued indiscriminate uh, airstrikes by the Syrian regime and Russia in Idlib province. Analysts say no one wants to get militarily entangled with Russia in Syria. Reina Sarampayat, SBS World News. Following the attack on Turkish troops in Syria, Turkey is demanding help from its NATO allies and appears to be using migrants as leverage for support. Ankara has facilitated the transfer of hundreds of refugees to the Greek border in what is seen as a threat to EU nations and at pressuring them into a military backing. Scores of migrants stream towards the Turkish border with Greece. <laughs> Their journey here from Istanbul, facilitated by government officials, who earlier herded families onto buses. Hundreds were shuttled to the border, a brazen reminder that Turkey is the gatekeeper of millions of refugees desperate to reach Europe. There's nothing here. My child, myself, maybe will live a little better in Europe. Turkish news outlets aired live broadcasts of migrants travelling to the Greek border. The images appearing strategically similar to those of the 2015 migrant crisis, when more than a million refugees crossed into Europe. Many arrived from Turkey on the Greek island of Lesbos. And this latest footage shows exactly that. A new wave of people arriving on the island in flimsy rubber dinghies. Their desperation seen as the latest weapon in President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's campaign in Syria. Amid the latest assault on Turkish troops, he's seeking military backing from the West. 
With the EU desperate to avoid a repeat of the past, President Erdogan appears to be using the migrants as leverage to gain further support in the fight in Idlib. But Greek authorities are pushing back. Tear gas and flash grenades used to stop hundreds of people from crossing into Greece. We will further strengthen the patrolling of our borders. Army and police forces from across the country have already arrived to boost forces already on the ground. The Greek Prime Minister taking to Twitter to warn his country will not suffer the consequences of decisions taken by others. Bulgaria, which also borders Turkey, is ramping up its security. The Prime Minister concerned over the escalation in Syria. There is a real threat from the events that are happening there. When they fight with missiles, people understandably run away. Turkey already hosts 3.6 million Syrian refugees. In a deal struck with the EU, it agreed to stem migration to member states. But that pledge appears to be under threat with Ankara saying it had no choice but to relax border controls due to a lack of support in hosting the refugees. Abby O'Brien, SBS World News. Violent clashes on the streets of Paris continued into the night on a day that saw one of the city's major train stations evacuated. Protesters are believed to have started a fire near Gare de Lyon in an attempt to disrupt a concert by a Congolese singer who was performing close by. They accuse singer Fali Ipupa of being close to the Congolese government. Demonstrators try to stop firefighters from reaching the scene, which authorities have described as scandalous behaviour. At least 20 people were killed and several others were injured when a train and a passenger bus collided in southwest Pakistan. The crash occurred at an unmanned level crossing about 500 kilometres from the port city of Karachi. Train accidents in Pakistan are often blamed on poor infrastructure and lack of safety standards. Indian police have detained as many as 630 people days after the worst bout of sectarian violence in the capital in decades. At least 38 people were killed in Hindu-Muslim violence this week. The clashes began over a controversial citizenship law introduced in December. Controversial Chinese swimmer Sun Yang is continuing to maintain his innocence in light of being handed a career-ending ban. He's told local media that he'll appeal the Court of Arbitration for Sport penalty for tampering with a blood sample. There are now calls for the medals he won to be reissued. In China, Sun Yang is a hero, winning six Olympic medals in the pool three of them gold. But now it's unlikely he'll ever swim for his country again. The athlete is sanctioned with an eight-year suspension starting today. Sun has been a polarising figure for years, serving a previous three-month doping ban in 2014. Four years later, his team destroyed a blood sample taken during a drug test. He had been cleared of wrongdoing by swimming's governing body, but the World Anti-Doping Authority appealed to the Court of Arbitration for sport. I didn't know who they are or what identification they could prove me, so I was not able to trust them. Overnight, the court ruled in favour of WADA. Sun Yang committed an anti-doping rule violation by tampering with the doping control. One of Sun's fiercest critics was his main rival, Australian swimmer Mac Horton, whose refusal to stand on the dais with him attracted global attention. A silent protest, perhaps. British swimmer Duncan Scott did the same thing days later. Both Scott and Horton have been widely panned for their stance by Sun supporters online and continue to be trolled today. Horton was asked this morning if he felt vindicated by the decision. My stance has always been about clean sport and uh, never about na nations or individuals. The Chinese Swimming Authority says it's deeply sorry about the ban. Sun supporters have lashed out against the decision on Chinese social media as he maintains his innocence. Sport law professor Jack Anderson says that appeal will take time and it's unlikely to be successful. I would say uh, very unlikely that he will swim again. 
competitively uh, and definitely, almost, almost certainly, he will not compete at Tokyo 2020. A huge blow to China's Olympic hopes, 146 days out from the Games. Rachel Carey, SBS World News. Coming up next... I'm Charlotte Lamb reporting live from the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras where the crowds are building ahead of the annual parade. How an Afghan interpreter has been given a lifeline by Australia. And on the road to recovery, a zoo in a bushfire ravaged community reopens its doors. The United States' longest war effort could be nearing an end as it prepares to sign a peace deal with the Taliban. The deal, which will see U.S. troops gradually pull out of Afghanistan, is due to be signed later tonight. But there are doubts about whether the agreement can actually bring peace to the fractured nation. The last time the Taliban ruled Afghanistan, they banned music. But Sarah Habib doesn't remember that the 13-year-old has only known war. She was born after the 2001 bombing campaign ordered by US President George W. Bush in response to the September 11 terrorist attacks. I'm a little concerned about my future if, because uh, if any group or uh, like Taliban or any other groups come to our country, I would no longer have my education and freedom. So I'm a little concerned about that, but I have lots of hope for the future. The Taliban has pledged that girls and women will still be able to go to school and to work if they wear a hijab. That and other guarantees appear to have struck a chord for America. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is on his way to Doha, where tonight the U.S. will sign an agreement with a former enemy it toppled from power 18 years ago. The first step, the withdrawal of almost 5,000 troops and a prisoner swap. The negotiations that follow are likely to be a major challenge. The Taliban regards the Afghan government as an American puppet. We think uh, it uh, as a product of uh, and the result of the occupation uh, the, which has been installed and imposed on the people of Afghanistan. But we accept uh, that they are a party to the conflict. And uh, uh, in that sense, uh, during the inter-Afghan negotiation, we will talk to them. The timing is difficult. The Afghan government is splintered after recent elections, with both sides claiming victory and both attempting to form government. The country's fledgling democracy could be in danger. I think the Taliban at this stage are uh, hoping very much uh, that in the face of the government being in disarray, that they will eventually gain the upper hand and they will be able to walk into power rather than being uh, a junior partner. But the US isn't leaving it to chance. 8,000 troops will stay behind. Tonight, there is music and celebrations in the streets. We are happy and hopeful that the killing of the Afghans will end. The mothers will no longer lose their children. And a growing belief that children like Sarah may see an end to conflict. Lucy Murray, SBS World News. A zoo that was forced to close its doors for two months following the devastating bushfires has reopened its doors. The Mogo Wildlife Park on the New South Wales south coast came under threat on New Year's Eve when the Curran fire bore down on its local township. Zookeepers and volunteers opted to stay to protect the more than 200 animals. New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian and RFS Commissioner Shane Fitzsimmons were among the guests at today's community event. Today, we are able to recount a story of absolute resilience, survival and hope for the future. And to, the, to Chad and his, I think, 15 zookeepers and the many, many volunteers, we're so deeply grateful because what you've been able to do here at the zoo is a wonderful source of inspiration for the whole community. And tourists will be able to visit from tomorrow. A 14-year-old boy has been praised by police for intervening in an alleged domestic violence incident in Sydney's northwest. The boy was travelling on a school bus when he saw a man allegedly punching a woman in the face. He got off the bus and confronted the man, refusing to leave until the man left the woman alone. The man then allegedly grabbed the boy by the throat before members of the public intervened. Police have commended the boy's actions. It was courageous, I think. Um, for a 14-year-old boy to intervene would have been very, very um, confronting, let alone an adult getting involved. 
The man has been charged with assault occasioning actual bodily harm and common assault and was refused bail. Emergency services have rescued 16 people who became stuck on a mountain in Queensland, north of, uh, northwest of Brisbane. The hikers got into trouble on Mount Tibrogargan in the Glasshouse Mountains National Park early this morning when the path became slippery in the rain. Rescue crews safely retrieved the group. One woman suffered minor injuries. Democratic presidential candidates are making their final push for votes ahead of the South Carolina primary tomorrow. As the race for the White House intensifies, the coronavirus outbreak is now a focal point in both sides of American politics. From Bernie Sanders, who trounced his opponents in Nevada, to Joe Biden, who's staked his campaign on winning here in South Carolina, this is the first presidential primary since coronavirus burst into the national conversation. Trump thought that his upbeat tweets could somehow stop the, the coronavirus. Well, I have news for Donald Trump. Like the rest of us, this virus is not impressed by his tweets. President Trump's handling of the challenge seized on by every candidate. This is his Katrina event, where it's like, whoa, like I have to do a job? Who knew? <laughs> he is incompetent, and this is the proof we are way behind on this. Michael Bloomberg, not on the Democratic ballot until next week, also weighing in. My experience is in dealing with crises like the coronavirus and like unemployment. President Trump swiping at those who wish to replace him. And this is their new hoax. Now the Democrats are politicizing the coronavirus. You know that, right? Eh? Coronavirus. Mr. Trump spending his Friday night at a campaign rally in the same state of South Carolina. Senator Sanders unimpressed. You would think that you'd have a president of the United States leading, work, working with scientists all over the world bringing people together to figure out how we're going to deal with this crisis. Health care, a major issue in every Democratic debate this season. But who's best equipped to manage the coronavirus outbreak now center stage? It's no surprise that the president who thinks that climate change is a hoax also thinks that coronavirus is a conspiracy. Democrats will only say horrible things even though they know we're doing a great job. We're doing a great job. After South Carolinians have their say tomorrow, Democrats in 14 states vote next Wednesday Australian time. The same field of presidential hopefuls, but the race now shadowed by a public health crisis. Pruthawan Espius, World News. And scientists in the US are racing to find a vaccine for the novel, novel uh, coronavirus, and a breakthrough is proving promising. Government agencies, universities, and several private companies are involved in the effort. But one lab says the North American caterpillar could hold some answers. The potential answer to stopping the coronavirus may be swishing around inside these trays. Researchers at the U.S. vaccine company Novavax say they have made a protein that stops the virus from binding to human cells. We are working countless hours, and I think we have made a significant uh, progress in the last you know, couple of weeks. Scientists here received the coronavirus gene sequence on January 10th. They say within weeks, they'd cloned a non-infectious element of the virus using ovary cells from a North American caterpillar as a protein factory. So now we have insect ovary cells making the spike protein, which we then purify, and that becomes a vaccine. The Novavax procedure has worked to make vaccines for the flu, Ebola, and MERS. For the coronavirus, it appears to be effective as well. Clinical tests are expected to begin this spring. Though full licensing takes years, vulnerable communities could receive the experimental vaccine on a compassionate use basis much sooner. The incentive is to save and help people as quickly and as soon as possible. In the race to contain the coronavirus, a win for the first to cross the finish line with a vaccine or a treatment is a win for all. And so government researchers here at the National Institutes of Health are partnering with private labs to quicken the pace of drug development. Moderna is another U.S. biofirm making progress. Its coronavirus vaccine is already in the NIH's hands and preparing for clinical trials in April. 
I think that's commendable. Um, if we have to come up with a billion doses, you might actually need you know, several vaccines that, that, are, that are working. The coronavirus has killed thousands and is heading toward a pandemic. U.S. health officials say this is the fastest science has ever moved to develop a vaccine, but it could still be more than a year before any is massively deployed. Well, just moments from now, Sydney will be alight with colour and sparkling from biodegradable glitter. Yes, it's the 42nd annual Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras. It's about to set off through the famous precinct of Oxford Street. And that's exactly where we find SBS World News reporter Charlotte Lamb tonight. Charlotte, good evening. Tell us about the mood in the build-up to the event. Well, nothing screams Sydney Mardi Gras quite like the sounds of Whitney Houston. And soon we'll be hearing the roaring sounds of 200 motorbikes. Uh, the Dykes on Bikes will open the annual parade as they have done since 1988 as one of the oldest LGBTIQ plus communities in Australia. They'll soon be followed by about 200 floats and people sashaying down the famous Oxford Street to a crowd of about 300,000. Now, the participants had to meet at Hyde Park in Sydney earlier, adding the final touches to their floats and costumes. We caught up with some of them. Have a listen to what they had to say. I'm here in honour of my son. He's um, uh, in a dark place at the moment, so I've just come down to, uh, yeah, just bring it home for him. Yeah. Hmm. And I'm here because of my grandson. He's transgender. Now, the theme this year is what matters, and that's really about asking yourself, what do you believe in and what do you think is worth fighting for? I spoke to our hosts of this year's event and asked them what the theme means to them. Look, I think, you know, what matters most is our hearts, and I think to take care of each other's hearts, and love really is love, and I think that's what's going to be on show tonight. Uh, the theme, what matters, or uh, well, what matters to me is a great party. But no, I also, <laughs> I, I echo what Narelda said. It's like, love is love and uh, bring our community together and, and, and show that, yeah, we are, we're just like everyone else. And, uh, but we do know how to throw a great parade and party. We are very good at that. Among the rainbows and biodegradable glitter, the parade is very much still a vehicle of protest for some, which is how it all began all those years ago before it evolved into a celebration. So you can expect to see some parade, um, some floats and people joyfully protesting things like the um, religious, the, sorry, the religious discrimination bill. But no matter the message, tonight is really about inclusion, celebration, and above all, love. Anton. <laughs> that is Charlotte Lamb reporting live, obviously cut out for that event tonight. Charlotte, have a good time. And for those of you not at the parade, you can catch SBS's live coverage of the event right after the news. Farmers with agricultural loans will no longer be able to be charged default interest by banks during drought or national disasters. The move is one of several changes to the banking code of practice that come into effect tomorrow. It's part of the industry's response to the Financial Services Royal Commission. Banks will also ensure services to people with limited English and those living in remote areas are accessible and inclusive. Other changes include removing overdraft and dishonour fees on basic or low fee accounts for concession card holders. And business owners uh, have just days left to give feedback on new laws designed to help them get paid more quickly. Some small businesses say they are being forced to take out loans due to late payments from large clients, which is killing their cash flow. Take a seat. Thank you. Adam Jacobs runs a large casting agency in Melbourne. Do you want to find a time to book you in to do shots? He's among millions of small business owners struggling with late payments. Late payments were about $58,000 overdue. Uh, it's about 25, 26 invoices. More than half of all small business invoices are paid late, with $115 billion held back by larger companies each year. It's really frustrating. Cash flow is vitally important uh, for your business. The small businesses have to pay their staff, their suppliers, their landlords in 7, 14 and at most 30 days. And they're finding big business blowing out payment times to 60 and 90 days. This is simply unacceptable. 
Small businesses can have a say until Friday on a draft law requiring big businesses to be more transparent about their payment times. Ombudsman Kate Carnell wants the federal government to do more. They're going to need to look really seriously at legislating. Legislating for big business to pay small business in 30 days or less. Small businesses operate on tight margins, so late payments can be a real threat to their long-term survival. And for those businesses run by migrants where English is not their first language, it can be even more challenging. New arrivals starting a business without capital can face greater cash flow issues and may be more willing to negotiate terms. So small businesses are having to give a discount to be paid in 30 days or less, which simply isn't reasonable. One way to speed up the process is by using electronic or e-invoicing. And so it means that when you're issuing an invoice to government or to a large supplier, it's going directly into their accounting system. Simon Foster set up a business that hires long-term unemployed workers to put business data online, ready for e-invoicing. It means there isn't going to be errors. It's going straight in, you're going to meet all the approvals requirements and then they can push the button and pay you. Anything that you can do to expedite the process would be welcome. With the economy hit hard by coronavirus fears, it's hoped faster payment times will keep the money moving. Ricardo Gonsalves, SBS World News. And if you'd like more on this story or other Australian small businesses, go online at, at any time. Just click on the Small Business Secrets tab on the SBS World News website or at SBS On Demand. French President Emmanuel Macron has invited a Christian woman who spent eight years on death row in Pakistan to live in his country. In 2010, Azir Bibi was sentenced to death for blasphemy after an argument with neighbours. After eight years in jail, her conviction was overturned, shining a light on Pakistan's blasphemy laws. Now she's calling on Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan to release others like her. The fury in Pakistan just over a year ago, as a woman sentenced to death for blasphemy was acquitted. Asia Bibi had been convicted on the flimsiest of evidence. Now she has broken her silence about the nightmare that began when she was accused of insulting the Prophet Muhammad. I was very scared. I couldn't even imagine something like this would happen to me. For a year and a half, I kept going to court. Not once did the judge hear my side of the story. They sentenced me to death without letting me speak. Asya told me she was working in the fields near her home in Punjab province when a mob came to drag her away. Her daughters, then aged eight and nine, saw it happen. They've since been reunited with their mother. It was so strange to see my husband and children after so long. I couldn't make sense of my emotions. But when I think about my daughter's childhood, I see them crying at being separated from me. That I cannot forget. After international campaigns and eight years on death row, Pakistan's Supreme Court dismissed the charges. But there are still Christians and Muslims being targeted by the blasphemy law. What would your message to the government of Pakistan be? Imran Khan, Prime Minister, ko ye mera pegam hai. To Prime Minister Imran Khan, I say, whenever something like this happens, it should be properly investigated. Innocents should not be punished, and innocent people jailed for this should be freed. Unko reha kiya jaye. In a statement, the government of Pakistan told us it had taken considerable steps to prevent misuse of the blasphemy law and that minorities are treated as equal citizens. <laughs> this afternoon, Asia Bibi went to meet President Macron, granted asylum here in France. But this period is one of huge adjustment for her. She told us she isn't yet sure what the future holds. During the war in Afghanistan, Australian soldiers worked closely with locals who helped them on the front line. 
And when Australia's combat mission ended, it had left some locally engaged employees fearing for their lives. But more than a thousand and their families have now been given a chance of a new life. Like many Australian parents, Ahmad Shah Shahi's afternoon involves picking up his kids from the local school. But just months ago, things were very different. I woke up, said that, uh, hey, this is Australia. It is not anymore Afghanistan. Ahmad was an interpreter working with Australian Defence Forces on the front line in Afghanistan. A decision that put not just himself, but his family at risk. So before you start your job as an interpreter, so they are explaining you that it is one of the risky, one of the dangerous jobs. Uh, means uh, you may lose even a part of your body, so there might be uh, attacks, uh, gunfire, suicide, IDs or anything else. Running for nearly two decades, the war in Afghanistan has claimed the lives of over 100,000 civilians and 43 Australian military service personnel. And when Australia withdrew its combat troops in 2013, local employees like Ahmad were left vulnerable. If the Taliban or the enemies know that they, you have worked with the coalition forces, so they're going to uh, kill, kidnap uh, even you or just any member of your family. So my own family was like in a hiding and uh, they couldn't go to school either. Afghan interpreters played a vital role in helping Australians to achieve their goal. After the Australians withdrew from Afghanistan, Ahmad was one of many former ADF contractors who were brought here. He arrived after seven years of waiting under a policy to resettle locally engaged employees. More than a thousand Afghan nationals and their families have been granted visas under the scheme. Retired Army Captain Jason Scans, who has seen firsthand the value of the Afghan interpreters, calls it our moral obligation. These guys wore the Australian combat uniform. Uh, they were exposed to the same dangers that we were exposed to, uh, if not uh, more at risk at times. And we were responsible for that interpreter, for their accommodation, for their welfare, um, you know, everything. And uh, we formed very tight um, bonds very quickly. A Department of Defence spokesperson told SBS over 1,000 Afghan nationals and their families have been granted a visa under this policy. And those that meet the criteria, the locally engaged employees, are given the highest visa processing priority, subject to the same visa processes as other refugee applicants. And I want to thank you in the same time to the Australian government that they have helped and supported me. But I want to request them that please help the ones who are still left in the dark in Afghanistan. A bright future for Ahmad and his family that he's hoping can be shared with his fellow interpreters. Abdullah Ali Khil, SBS World News. An important story. Coming up next, uh, Greta Thunberg brings thousands to the streets, but critics question the value of students protesting. Also, hands off the long-time tradition banned by football clubs due to coronavirus. Greta Thunberg has warned global leaders she will not be silenced when the world is on fire. The teenage climate change activist addressed a crowd of more than 15,000 people in Bristol at the start of a climate march in the city. The Swedish activist told the crowd that it was young people's responsibility to solve the world's problems. Greta Thunberg! Even she seemed overwhelmed by the size of this crowd. In the middle of the school day, thousands of pupils walked out of lessons to be here. I will not be silenced while the world is on fire, will you? Your leaders are behaving like children. So it falls on us to be the adults in the room. Like the things she says are so impactful and so emotional. Uh, yeah, I feel like it is very I, I could emotional. Cry. Just to see her hair yeah. is amazing. Like, like hair, she's so small, and to hear her voice, like, actually, really gets me. Yeah. Like, the crowd, it's just amazing. 
The rally and the march that followed were organised by teenagers in just one week after Greta Thunberg got in touch. David, come on. Police had warned that safety may not be adequate, with no idea how many young people would turn out. This is what is known as the Greta effect, and the organisers, the authorities, this whole city seems quite overwhelmed by the protest. There are so many people... Sasha is 10. Are you frightened? Um, a bit. I'm frightened that I'll lose my dad, and um, I'm frightened that the planet is going to die um, soon because of some people who just won't really care that much. I mean, I just had, like, a little cry. Um, the sixth formers who organised the event say its success is proof that they should be taken seriously. It's been manic, it's been a lot, but we've pulled off so much in, in the eight days we've had. It just goes to show that individuals, when they get together for a cause, a good cause, like, amazing things can happen. <laughs> But with roads closed and buses cancelled, some questioned if a school strike should be encouraged. How much oh, difference does it make? Nothing. Nothing. It ain't going to make nothing. Whatever these doing now today, nothing will happen, will it? But her fans say this is what education should be about. Greta Thunberg has certainly left her mark here. Well, time now for Saturday Night Sport with Lucy Zelich. And Lucy, coronavirus still dominating the headlines as it continues to have a major impact on world football. It certainly is, Anton. Good evening to you. FIFA President Gianni Infantino admits next month's international fixtures are at risk of being postponed. A host of friendlies, Euro 2020 and World Cup qualifiers are all under threat. <laughs> With coronavirus concerns threatening March's international schedule, Gianni Infantino says it's a matter of priorities. The health of uh, persons is much more important uh, than any football game. If games have to be uh, postponed uh, or played without spectators or whatever for a period of time, uh, we have to simply follow uh, the instructions. The FIFA boss optimistic Euro 2020 will proceed but not so certain on what comes before. I think the Euro will take place in, in, in June and uh, before that we have many more matches uh, at the international level with a lot of travel and we have to hope that it will uh, decrease. Effects are being felt across European football. The Swiss Super League cancelling all matches this weekend with a government ban on events with more than 1,000 people. In Italy, Inter Milan played Luda Goretz behind closed doors on Friday. Monday's clash with league leaders Juventus, among five Serie A matches closed to the public. In England, precautions are ramping up. Newcastle and West Ham restricting physical contact at their training grounds. We've agreed that fist pumps, no shaking hands at the moment, and uh, and we're all happy with that. We're glued to the TV and where it's going to go next, and, and uh, let's hope it doesn't get any worse in this country. Tottenham's Son Hyung Min, in South Korea for surgery, will self-isolate when he returns. While Spanish La Liga side Valencia have cancelled public gatherings in enclosed spaces, after the first confirmed coronavirus cases in the city. Joel Spreadborough, SBS World News. On the field, and Newcastle has handed Perth its first A-League defeat since last November. Veteran defender Nikolai Topol Stanley unleashed a stunning strike from long distance to give the Jets an early lead. The glory equalised from the spot through Neil Kilkenny, but Roy O'Donovan struck the winner for Newcastle in the 74th minute. The win keeps alive the Jets' slim finals hopes. Still with football and Sydney FC suffered just its second loss of the season and once again it came at the hands of their biggest rivals. Mitch Duke's second half header lifted the Wanderers to victory in last night's derby. Western Sydney finished the game with 10 men after Daniel Georgievski was sent off. He then clashed with Sky Blues coach Steve Corica in the tunnel. He's a competitor and um, obviously he made a mistake as well, kicking out because can't have that, especially in the face. The Wanderers are now unbeaten in their past four matches. Last place to Norwich boosted its English Premier League survival hopes with an upset win over Leicester this morning. Jamal Lewis scored the Canaries' first goal from open play since New Year's Day. Norwich now sits four points from safety. 
The Perth Wildcats are just one win away from a 14th NBL Grand Final appearance after beating Cairns in an overtime classic. Bryce Cotton starred with 42 points, hitting a record-breaking 10 three-pointers. The defending champions coming from behind to take a 1-0 lead in the best of three semi-final series. As a contest, it ticked all the boxes. And again, oh, it's fouled! Two superstars of the game in league MVP Bryce Cotton and MVP runner-up Scott Machado going head-to-head. -head. Between them, the pair racked up 73 points. There was big play after big play. It was close. It went to overtime. It was, you know... It was grit, it was individual brilliance. It was Cotton weaving his magic from the get-go. He had 14 points in the first quarter. The Wildcats up by nine at the break. Can stormed back in the second. Skipper DJ Newbill kept Cotton quiet, landing 13 himself. The visitors led by nine at half-time. The final quarter saw six lead changes. A thriller destined for overtime and Cotton proved to be the difference. Sinking nine points, becoming the first player to make ten triples in an NBL semi-final, racking up 42 points. You know, you get so caught up in the moment, uh, you don't really think, you know, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that, because we have so many weapons on the floor, as you see. Taipan's coach Mike Kelly left to rue a turnover tally of 17 to Perth 3. You can't turn the ball over here. You can't give up a lot of offensive rebounds and uh, it's pretty simple. Um, they got a lot more shots than us. Game two of the best of three series is tomorrow night in Cairns. Brett Clancy, SBS World News. Ash Barty's four-match winning run over Czech rival Petra Kvitova has come to an end in the semi-finals of the Qatar Open. The big hitting eighth seed dominated the first set, breaking the world number one twice to take an early advantage. Barty fought back in the second, holding her serve to level the match, but Kvitova prevailed in the decider to record her sixth career win over the Australian. She'll next face Belarusian Anya Sabalenka in the final. New Zealand to set up an elimination showdown with Australia at Cricket's T20 World Cup. The White Ferns were bowled out by Bangladesh for 91 today after losing 8 for 36. But the Tigers' run chase stalled when Joe T retired hurt following a nasty blow to the throat. Bangladesh was all out for 74. New Zealand will meet the tournament hosts on Monday with the winner securing second spot in Group A. India continued its perfect record at the tournament to seal top spot in Group A. Sri Lanka's total of nine for 113 wasn't enough as India comfortably chased down the target to win by seven wickets. To AFL and there are calls for state of origin football to continue following Victoria's big win in the bushfire relief match. More than 50,000 fans turned out for the exhibition game. Victoria booted 11 goals straight to run away 46 point winners over the All-Stars. The code's best players put on an entertaining show and the winning coach believes there's room for the concept on the playing calendar. Yeah, I definitely do. Um, I think the timing of it is right. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say it's an annual event, but probably, you know, every third year perhaps would be, would be something to look at. Meantime, GWS midfielder Tim Taranto will have scans after dislocating his shoulder in the Giants' pre-season win over Sydney. And finally in sport, the Kangaroos have moved to the top spot of the AFLW's Conference A with a win over the Gold Coast. Leading by 15 at half-time, North Melbourne survived a third quarter fight back from the Suns, holding on to claim their third win of the season by 13 points. Fabulous stuff. And Anton, that is the day in sport. Thanks, Lucy. Well, coming up, the weather and, well, here's something. It looks like steak. Its texture is like steak. But would your taste buds be fooled by this 3D printed meal? Weather now, ex-tropical cyclone Esther is generating intense rain, storms and wind over the northwest of the country. Troughs are bringing showers and storms over parts of Western Australia and Eastern Queensland. Mostly clear skies elsewhere due to a high. In the major centres, partly cloudy in Sydney, a dry day in Melbourne, partly cloudy in Brisbane and Canberra and showers in Adelaide. Grey skies in Perth, looking further afield, partly cloudy in Auckland, thunder in Nandi, rain for Tahiti. In Southeast Asia, partly cloudy in Bangkok, a few showers in Denpasar, rain in Port Moresby. 
For the north, cloudy in Beijing, rain also in Hanoi and partly cloudy in uh, Hong Kong. Clear skies ahead for Manila, clouds in Taipei. Heading west, partly cloudy in Baghdad, a few showers in Beirut, a drizzle, a bit of drizzle in Delhi and rain ahead for Islamabad. To Europe now, showers in London, a few showers in Paris as well, and rain in Madrid. Fine in Athens, grey skies in Berlin. In Africa, partly cloudy in Addis Ababa, rain in Algiers, fine in Cairo. Cloudy in Casablanca and thunder rumbling in over Johannesburg. In South America, partly cloudy in Asuncion, showers in Bogota, a few showers in Caracas, rain in La Paz. And for North America, foggy in LA, cloudy in Toronto, fine in New York. A startup company in Spain is looking to challenge your taste buds while offering a more sustainable food supply system. It's producing a vegan meal with the texture and appearance of a real beef steak by printing it with a 3D printer. The novel printer uses syringes filled with uh, plant-based ingredients and takes about 20 minutes to make. But those who've tried it say it is well worth the wait. That is The World this Saturday. We'll have news updates for you throughout the evening. Stay tuned for SBS's live coverage of the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, which is coming up next. From the team, good night.